Hello and welcome back to the Innovate for Impact podcast. As usual, you've got Tracy Newman and Dan Bentley. And today we're really excited to be joined by David Pearson, the CEO from the Australian Alliance to End Homelessness. So welcome, David. G'day. Great to be here. So much. Um, so just thought to, to kick us off today, uh, if you don't mind just sharing us with us all a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Yeah, no worries. So um, I'm the CEO of the Australian Alliance to End Homelessness, and it's nice to have an organisation that's the title is pretty literal about what we do. We're, we're really committed to the idea that ending homelessness is possible. Um, and in fact, it's a sort of a thing that more and more communities around the world are demonstrating. And what we do is we bring people who are committed to that idea together, like whether they're from private sector, public sector, not-for-profits, housing providers, homelessness providers, the health sector, anyone who wants to be part of this idea that we can end homelessness and wants to help demonstrate that, uh, we bring them together to work together towards that common mission. That's really exciting. I love the idea that you've managed to get so many diverse people with sometimes slightly different perspectives and actually get them to work together. So um, I think there's probably some some really great learning that you've had around, you know, how to get all these various different people with different perspectives to collaborate effectively. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the key things about it is, is being really clear and intentional about what we're trying to do. Um, and when you think about a problem like homelessness, it's a really big, complex issue. And in fact, it sits alongside some other big problems around that, you know, in Australia, we have a home ownership crisis. We have a housing affordability crisis. We have a rental crisis. We have homelessness generally in crisis. And then inside that box of homelessness, there's, there's a crisis around people sleeping on the street. And even then, again, inside that box, there's a crisis around the people who've been on the street for sometimes decades, who are chronically homeless, who have been in and out of emergency accommodation, hospitals, prisons, you know, a whole range of things. And, and they're stuck in this cycle of, of homelessness. And so the Alliance to End Homelessness, our, our goal and our mission is to end all homelessness. But we're going to start with that really chronic um massively disadvantaged group of people who, who who the data suggests die up to 30 years younger than people who have stable housing. So the, the ability to bring together the collaboration and the alliance was being really intentional saying, we can't solve everything all at once. What we're going to do is try and break this problem up and to focus on that most vulnerable, most chronically unwell, most at risk group of people and say, what is it we can do by working together collaboratively in place to solve that problem? It sounds like um, with all those different organizations involved that you're really trying to address it from a systemic perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, the, the issue is it's, it's sort of it's a difficult balancing act sometimes because what we want to do is be 100% person-centered. Like you can't solve an issue without working out what the issues are for that person. And the thing about homelessness, given how complex it is, is every person's story is different. Every person has different needs and those sorts of things. And we need to better respond to those needs. But if we really want to solve the problem, we can't just focus on helping the individuals we see. Otherwise, all we're really doing is sort of fishing people out of the river. And, you know, that sort of Desmond Arch, Archbishop Desmond Tutu quote, you know, at some point we've got to stop fishing people out of the river, go upstream and find out why they're falling in. Uh, and so we've got to focus on the individuals we're trying to help, but we've also got to go upstream and make sure we're finding out why are people falling into homelessness in the first place? And that, that's the kind of key innovation that we're sort of trying to drive through the Australian Alliance and the work we do through the what we call the Advance to Zero campaign is to think about not only how do we have a person-centred approach that helps end the homelessness of the people that we come across, but also helps prevent it. Um, and that's really easy to say. It's very hard to do, right? Like it's the thing that governments, agencies, everyone wants to focus on. And so it brings you back to that thing I was saying before is break this problem up. Don't try to do prevention of housing affordability and homelessness and everything everywhere all at once. Try and break it up for a place, so local communities, generally local government areas. Break it up for a cohort, that chronic homelessness group, uh, and work beyond the specialist homelessness system who's doing their best in a really starved environment for resources and bring in the health system and the correction system and the other places where government services are talking and having interactions with these people and step stopping the inflow into homelessness and, and the chronic homelessness that that group of people were talking about. So it's sort of really intentional in all of those things, but it's definitely about systems. I like the idea that you've um, that you've really brought it, you've been really targeted and really specific um, and that that's one of the ways that you've been able to sort of, I guess, move a problem that is 
big and 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 at risk of being overwhelming um you know is there, is there anything else that you've done to to really bring people on board and and help them work together and 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 I guess stay defined within what you've agreed to work on yeah so having a really clear sort of theory of change or strategy that's about that intentionality of breaking the problem up is obviously crucial which we just talked about the other thing though is like having measurement and data and 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 measuring this and so you just said tracy look this is a really really big problem well In Australia, the problem of overall homelessness is a really big problem, but the problem of rough sleeping homelessness is actually quite a small part of the overall problem of homelessness. So rough sleeping being people on the streets, in their cars, that sort of stuff. But if you're overcrowded or couch surfing, that's homelessness too, but it's not that rough sleeping bit. So rough sleeping is a lot smaller. And then inside that rough sleeping box, you've got the chronic box as well. And that's smaller again. And so what we often do when we think about these problems is we just keep making it bigger and and we go off and go to government and say, you need to invest all these billions to fix this problem. And actually, who's going and sort of breaking the problem up and going, hang on, it's actually only seven people who are chronically rough sleeping in this community on this night. Um, How can we solve it for those seven and not just tonight, but for tomorrow night and the night after and the night before? And that doesn't result, that doesn't involve, as we were talking before, about just solving the homelessness for those seven people tonight. It makes sure that we find out why those seven people came into homelessness in the first place, into rough sleeping homelessness, for example, and find out what is it we could have done when they were in the emergency department to make sure that they weren't discharged into homelessness or the corrections department or why did they lose their tenancy? And, you know, one tragic story of a guy that I met one time, he, he said it would 10 bucks, it's 10 bucks would have saved him from almost 30 years on the street. And the 10 bucks was the difference between what he could afford to pay for his electricity bill or his rent bill, I can't remember what the bill was, but when he couldn't pay the $10 difference for his electricity bill, he, his electricity got cut off and then you know he, let, he then he got evicted and then he ended up having 30 years on the street. And if we went upstream, it would have been a $10 intervention, <laughs> roughly, you know, and, and that 30 years, what it cost us as a society to have him in and out of emergency departments, in and out of prison, in and out of rehab facilities, in and out of crisis accommodation, and spend 30 years on the street and the, and the life expectancy reduction that had for him because the health impacts of sleeping rough are catastrophic. Um, you know, it just, that we need to go upstream, right? And that's just really one simple explanation. But it, it starts uh, with your question on measuring. And, and the tragedy in Australia is we don't actually measure. Like we, we estimate how many people sleep rough and we estimate how much homelessness there is through the census every five years. After that, we measure the efficiency of homelessness services and how they provide services to homelessness people. And we can measure how many times we turn away people from homelessness services because there's not enough resources. But we don't actually measure how many people are experiencing homelessness on any given night in most communities. If you go and ask governments, federal, state, local, they can't tell you most of the time. They, they sometimes do what's called a street count, but it's just a point in time a point in time capture. And there's a lot of problems with just going out and counting people in the street and not actually knowing their stories, their names, those sorts of things. So what we do is go out and understand by name everyone who's experiencing homelessness in a community. And that involves rallying everyone in that community to get together, whether it's rotary group groups or specialist homelessness services or health providers or local governments, everyone come out as part of what we call a Connections Week. Find everyone who's experiencing homelessness, know them by name, do a survey, understand their needs, their mental health needs, their any any other support that they might need to not only get housing but to sustain housing and put that on what we call a by name list. And that by name list is the sort of one of the key innovations as part of the work we do. And it's, it sounds so ridiculously simple, right? But that list, there is no shared list in most communities. Most agencies will have a list of the people they're helping, but they can't share that with the other agencies. And so no one knows where the gaps are. And so you can't actually say how many people are homeless in the community. So my hometown of Adelaide, um, we were one of the first communities to set up one of these by name lists. Um, and we went out and counted and found all that. And we found about 160 people. And we can tell you, Every month now, we update the data on a public website to tell you how many people are sleeping rough in the Adelaide CBD. And the same thing now occurs in the Brisbane CBD and the Perth CBD and the Melbourne CBD and, the, and Sydney CBD and a range of other local government areas around the country. So the movement that we're trying to build is to get local communities to get together and start measuring. Because if you don't measure, you can't change. You can't manage what you don't measure. And the sort of tragedy in Australia is we just don't measure these things. 
Wow, I, I just find that. I think if you asked most people, they would assume that this has already been done. Um, because it, as you said, it seems so simple. Um, and, and often the assumption is that all of the easy things have been done and this problem is so massive and it's not getting fixed because, you know, as you said, it, it requires billions of dollars and, and incredible systemic change. And there's not necessarily enough political will to make a difference. And yet when you tell a story of somebody for the sake of $10, experience 30 years of homelessness I think if you if you spoke to anyone in the community and said would you be prepared to you know give someone ten dollars to say that they would say yes and and they would assume I I don't know I'm just blown away that that this by name list hasn't already been thought of and done and it seems like um, you're actually finding some really innovative opportunities that are just so simple yeah, I know it's frustrating. <laughs> I mean, there are lists out there. And so to distinguish between the by name list that we sort of create is, is really what Dan was talking about before. It's a system wide list that is shared amongst everyone in the system. And making sure you can do that in a way that respects the privacy and the consent of the informed consent of the people that are sharing their data is really, really important. So we've gone and done that work. And those kind of issues of sharing and consent become really challenging for governments because. If government has a list of everyone and all their details and they share it across government, it becomes problematic because, you know, these are vulnerable people and then what if police forces have access to the list and all those sorts of things. So a really central component of the innovation we're driving is that this list is held on behalf of the people who are experiencing homelessness. It's their data. We hold it on their behalf and the community owns it on their behalf, not government. Um, So it's a really sort of important part of the distinction here. Because there's sort of making sure that the community owns the data is one part, but making sure that we're not trying to solve everything everywhere all at once is another part of it because that's where we've gotten lost over decades in Australia, trying to measure the problem. And the best we've been able to do is the census every five years. And it's again, that's an estimate and it's not by name. So, yeah, having it community owned is important um, and making sure that it's um, measuring what you can, where you can, just work with the coalition of the willing. Don't try and boil the ocean at once is what we sort of often say and try and get governments to do it statewide, all at once, all forms of homelessness. It's too big. It's too complicated. It'll cost too much money and we'll never get there. Um, Well, we will eventually. Eventually in Australia, we will sort this out. But what we're trying to do is help governments do it by just demonstrating that it's doable and communities have got it, rather than waiting for some royal commission that might create it in 10 years' time and then, you know, it'll be a 10-year process and spend hundreds of millions doing it. We've done, we've created all these lists just out of the goodwill of local communities and with a little bit of philanthropy and agencies chipping in and, and, and some scattered support from local governments, but not from state governments, sorry, but no sort of systemic wide sort of investment across Australia to support this. How have you been able to get that trust, David, from from those communities? Um, like you said, I think, yeah, there would be that fear for some people that some of that data could be used, like you said, with police forces and you know, having their name on that list. What have you been able to do to sort of alleviate their concerns and, and build that trust so that they are willing to participate? Not really that hard. Like the, we do this all the time. Vulnerable people share their, their stories and their information with agencies every day. And it's just about informed consent um, and making sure you put the processes in place. And the, the, um, the, the sole reason we collect this data and that this is what we tell people and this is the basis on which they give their consent is to help people into housing um, and to help them with the support they need to sustain that housing. So the data is not collected to help the police forces find someone to issue a warrant. You know, it's not it's not issued to help governments do income management or whatever it might be, any kind of punitive measures. This is solely for the purposes of accessing housing. And the other interesting thing I think about the way we do our work is, um, you know, it's, it's confronting to say, but when we go out and do the Connections Week, right, you'll often get people who are like, oh, don't worry about me. There's, you know, go and interview Bob over there. He's more needy or go and talk to Sally. She, she's got greater needs than me. Don't worry about me. And that often happens and so they won't engage with the system. And what we go to them and say is, actually, no, what we're trying to do is create this by name list so we know the needs of everyone in the community. So you sharing your story will help Bob and Sally. So please put your name on the list and share because people people have experienced 30 years of homelessness because they've given up trying to engage with the system. The system has let them down time and time again. There's no point. Why would they put their name on a list that never goes anywhere? You know, these are the stories. So 
we we encourage them to share their information, not only that it can hopefully help them, but also just help us understand the needs in this community so we can better plan for what we need. Because we often say, oh, we need more housing, but what kind of housing? Where does it need to be? What kind of support needs to go with that housing? Uh, and that's the that's the detailed data that we collect to help improve the way in which the housing and homelessness and the service systems work with this vulnerable group of people. That's really interesting. Um, and talking about measurement, but has there been some outcomes either you know that 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 give you that uh, hope that the work that you've done and the work that you're doing is actually making a difference for Bob and Sally and yeah everyone else um so what we're doing yeah <laughs> what we're doing is very much inspired by some efforts that have been happening around the world um and, and particularly in north america and the united states and canada and you know we're talking about homelessness no one really generally thinks about looking to the united states as an example of what we want to do in relation to homelessness when you just hear the horror stories out of that country but you have to remember it's a very large country that's very diverse there are local communities um 16 of them in fact who have ended homelessness they have ended chronic homelessness. They've they also ended it for veterans, um, rough sleeping, chronic veterans, rough sleeping homelessness. So they've done that. And what they did is they went out and understood everyone by name. They rallied the community behind saying, how is it we can have homelessness in this community? And so one of the first um, local government areas, if you will, in the United States is a place called Arlington County. And you've heard of Arlington. It's the home of the Pentagon in Arlington Cemetery. And they said, how is it that we can be the home of America's war dead and have veterans literally sleeping on the gates of Arlington Cemetery? And so they said, "It's this isn't about, you know, the homeless choosing to be homeless, you know, that false kind of narrative that's out there, or, or it's about, you know, the lack of housing or whatever else. It's about us as a community. Is this acceptable in our community? And if the answer is no, what are we all going to do to work on this? Not, not leave it to the homelessness minister or the local homelessness service. How do we all get together and work towards a common goal that breaks the problem up, that understands it in real time with data and all of those things together help them make homelessness rare so that there is very little of it. Um, it doesn't happen as much as it used to because we've been able to go upstream and prevent. Um, it makes it brief. So if someone is homelessness, in, in, in if someone does fall into rough sleeping, so it doesn't mean that, you know, no homelessness anymore ever in Arlington. What it means is it's rare, it's brief. So if someone falls into homelessness, they have a brief um, experience and we're able to rapidly rehouse them. And anyone who we do come across, when we do help them house them, that they sustain that housing, they don't fall back into homelessness. So it's non-reoccurring. So rare, brief and non-reoccurring, that's the three conditions for success for ending homelessness. Uh, and then we have a way of measuring that in a statistical way, what's called functional zero. So the, the, the reason we had to create that measure is because absolute zero. So say, for example, there was 20 people sleeping rough in Arlington um, on, on today. We could house them all by next Thursday. And as soon as Friday comes along, one more person falls into homelessness, we fail by definition, right? So you need a dynamic measure of ending homelessness over time, not just at a point in time. And that's really the diff what functional zero measures. It measures how have we made homelessness rare, brief and non-reoccurring, our standard for defining what an end to homelessness looks like. And that's what 16 communities in the United States have done. Um, and then there's a bunch of progress we've made in Australia utilising that approach. Um, so as I mentioned, Adelaide was one of the first communities to get to what we call quality data so that you know that you've got everyone in your system, that everyone in the system is, is um, participating and feeding into the by name list and that you're able to measure what's going on in your system. So the number of people coming in and the number of people going out add up, it's like balancing your checkbook. And so that's what quality data looks like on a by name list for a system. Your inflows equal your outflows. And outflows are not all housing, unfortunately. Some of the outflows are um, gone inactive. We've lost touch with them because they've moved out of the area. They've, um, they've gone to jail, they're in, you know, they've died. That's an outflow that um, is not housing. Um, so inflow and outflow needs to be measured for the system in order to calculate functional zero and make sure we can get to this standard of rare, brief and non-recurring. No, that's that's actually really helpful because I've I've seen the 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 reports and I've seen the 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 talk of zero homelessness um, and it's really lovely to be able to actually see how that actually looks in reality and also to be able to see that it ha that there are success stories of communities working together to solve this this problem um, and that it has actually been effective because um, I think when you know, and 
we see a lot of stories that are really sad and uh, really large. As you said, you know, when you think about America, you, you hear horrible stories of um, the homelessness and um, and it can feel like the problem's too big to actually be able to solve. So it's good to know that there is data, that there are success stories and that 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 functional zero and exactly how that, that works in reality is really helpful. But um, I think, yeah, h- how do you deal with that whole idea that the problem is too large to solve apart from breaking it down? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think breaking it down, obviously, and having that clear strategy and, and rallying the community to be part of it, having a much more collaborative approach. This problem can't be solved by one agency, one government, one program, one pill. It has to be solved by communities working together. Uh, and that's sort of central. That's been the lesson from the communities that have done it. Um, you know, you, you can make massive progress by the governments just investing, and they should do that, and, and I will always call for them to do that. The simplest way to end homelessness in Australia is for governments to raise the rate of new start so that you can actually live on it, to invest in more support, in more housing. Um, but we also need to make sure, even when we got everything we want from governments to do that, that we're able to integrate those efforts and make them person-centred and make sure we're finding the people who do have experiences that, you know, things that happen in their life that tip them into or get them close to homelessness and make sure we can either prevent it or rapidly resolve it. Uh, and that is um, why this this approach, I think, is needed and that's really central to how you get people on board with it, I think. The other um, thing if I might add is um, around uh, in Australia, so I sort of mentioned that example of Adelaide and getting quality data, but actually a really wonderful thing's happened in, in Melbourne recently. So the community of Port Phillip, um, they have, um, so Port Phillip's kind of like the St Kilda area for people not from Victoria, um, <clears throat> and they have a quality by name list and they have measured everyone who's experiencing homelessness in that community for a number of, uh, for a while now. And, you know, to get a bit data tech nerdy here for a sec, what you do is you create an average number of people who are in your system um, and one of the milestones that get you closer and closer to your goal of ending homelessness, because we need to know, is our, is our effort having an effect, right? And one of the things you can measure to know whether you're getting close to your goal is not are we housing more people or those sorts of things, is are we shifting, a re- are we making a reduction in the number of people in that community? So you have an average number and it jumps around, but if you're able to shift that average down and sustain that over a number of months, so over five months, that's a statistically significant reduction and that's what we call a shift reduction. And ending homelessness starts with shift reductions in your number of homeless in your community. And Port Phillip was the first community outside of North America to achieve a shift reduction using quality data in homelessness. And I think that's a phenomenal achievement. Um, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it takes five minutes to explain what it means, but it's, <laughs> it is a huge, um, it's a huge milestone that we, an Australian community has reached. And now the challenge is to sustain that shift reduction and then to achieve the next shift reduction and to learn from that. Uh, and they can demonstrate that with data. They've got these beautiful graphs that show the shift reduction, right? Um, so that's that's another example in Australia of, of where this is happening. But there's plenty. Every community is doing something slightly different in Australia and they have and every community has to tailor this approach because every community is different. The policy settings are very different in each state and territory across Australia and the individual needs of the people that need help are very different. So it requires tailoring. It's not, unfortunately, we can just take off the shelf a book from the US and say, hey, they've got 16 communities. We're going to just copy the same thing. It's all well, no, conceptually, We've got the functional zero measure. Conceptually, we've got this idea of a by name list, but it's what you do with it that really counts. Uh, and that's that's what we're sort of really driving in Australia at the moment. So when you say it's what you do with that list that really counts, what are some of the things that you have been able to do and what are what sort of difference would you expect that that would make? That's where sort of innovation comes in, right? Like there's sort of we have to do something different. We have to learn. Um, and one of the things that I found um, really interesting about what was um, a key ingredient in the success in the United States was sort of shifts in mindset. And, you know, when you think about mindset shifts, it's like, oh, well, if we think positively, you know, there'll just be more houses and we can end homelessness. Like, you know, when I, when I heard that, I thought, what a lot of BS, right? Um, but actually... It's been one of the more powerful things because we, we, we exist in a, such a resource constrained environment in the homelessness sector. And so the refra- there's just not enough houses. We've got no houses. How do we deal with this? We've got increasing demand, you know, 
And that sort of scarcity mindset becomes really constricting. Like there is no denying we exist in a resource JF environment. There's no denying we don't have enough resources to do the work we're doing, that there's not enough houses, that there's growing demand, right? But where does that get us? Like we, we, we need better advocacy, of course, but we need to sort of think about what is it the things that we can control and how do we focus our efforts on that? Um, because there's a lot of despondency, there's a lot of burnout. Like in the homelessness sector, the, the the workforce turnover is huge because you're just in this resource-starved environment. You're just basically putting more and more band-aids on on people and pulling them out of the river. To use that analogy, we're constantly pulling people out of the river where we're exhausted and almost drowning ourselves. And it's like, hang on, at which point do we send someone upstream to figure out what's going on? And so that scarcity mindset is a real constrictor on the on, on things, but. The, the other things that have been really helpful in terms of those mindsets is just like a bias for action. Like, what do we do that can take action to make improvements? How do we learn in real time? Like, how do we fail quickly so that we don't, um, you know, make these problems bigger and bigger and have massive failure? How do we make the problem smaller and smaller and have small failures, learn from it, pivot and change what we're doing? Um, so that kind of, you know, all of these things that are really well known to the innovation community, how do we get that more into the homelessness services system and to the human services system? And that, and that is, there's a whole bunch of buzzwords that I just used just then that would mean absolutely nothing to a lot of people who've been a lifelong volunteer in a homelessness service or a social worker, you know. So giving them the support to do that, giving them the environment where that innovation can be done. Um, that requires CEOs of homelessness agencies to enable their workforce to do that, to enable them to do it beyond their own organisation and doing it collaboratively with others um, and focusing on a shared mission that we want to end homelessness. We don't just want to help as many homeless as possible, as important as that is, but we want to end it. Um, and ending requires innovation and ending requires working collaboratively and it requires using data to change our behaviour and our practices every day and, and in being informed by that. Uh, and that that starts with mindset shifts as much as I thought that is BS. I think it's actually really, really central. It, I, I love hearing you talk about that because we we feel like we bang on about the same thing all the time because, you know, when you talk about innovation, people who, um, you, you know, they, they think about, you know, the type of innovation that costs millions of dollars and they don't naturally think about the types of small, tangible changes that make a significant difference, particularly when done collaboratively uh, across a system. And that's that's kind of what we talk about all the time because as soon as you sort of get out of the weeds and, and lift your head even just slightly and start um, working on what is possible, then you know, you make a small change and then it's like the domino effect. That that creates another change which creates another change. But it really does start with that mindset and, and start with, you know, let's just begin by focusing on those small actions that we can take right now and then and build it out from there. Yeah, because the outcomes here, like 100% agree, but the outcomes are so serious. That's why we need to do it, right? In homelessness, we don't measure how many people are experiencing homelessness. We don't even measure how many people are dying, um, who, who are homeless and dying. Like you don't put homeless on the death certificate. You put pneumonia or you put, you know, whatever. So um, in Australia, we think there's 427 people who die each year, but we don't know. That's our estimate. Um, and just to use that example of small chests of change, there was there was a study done in the US that found that out of, you know, sort of 2.5 million hospital admissions, there was about a 13% adverse incidence rate. And that led to people dying unnecessarily. That was, you know, 44 to 98,000 unnecessary deaths in the US health system overall. This was a little while ago. And they made small changes using this sort of improvement science methodology that's really informed the work we do and the work that the American communities do. And, and the small change that they did that helped reduce those deaths and reduce those, um, you know, adverse events was changing the way they washed their hands to reduce infections in the hospital system. That was the change they made. There was no large scale investment building new hospitals. That was the small, tiny innovation that had a massive impact. So what's the equivalent of that in homelessness? Well, how do we speed up the point at which we identify a person who's experiencing homelessness and get them into a house? How do we take that from a three week process down to a three day process, for example? And one of the small incremental changes that we've been able to make in some communities to help speed that up 
is making it easier for someone who's been on the street to get all their ID sorted out rather than it taking, you know, if you've been on the street, you don't have a birth certificate, you don't have a driver's license, you're not registered for Centrelink, all those sorts of things, they get in the way of you getting access to the house. You can't use, you can't get in a house and set up your electricity if you don't have your Centrelink paperwork, you don't have your birth certificate to get your Centrelink paperwork. How do we speed that process up? And, and getting everyone, all the agencies that are involved in that together and wrapping them around the person experiencing homelessness rather than getting them to go and trans to, to go around to the five or six different agencies that's involved in solving that. So getting a three week administrative process down to two weeks or two days is something that the homeless sector can fix. It doesn't require the federal government to do a national housing and homelessness strategy to fix that. We can solve that on our own in our own communities um, and speed up and make improvements. So that ability to innovate, try things, make improvements um, and, and make sure you're measuring is so central to um, utilising mindset shifts and things we were just talking about. Um, I think we've hit all of our points that we were looking to hit today. Um, before we sort of wrap up, was there anything else, you know, any other messages you want to make sure people hear, any calls of action, anything like that, David? Yeah, like we're trying to build a movement here. Like we're trying to make people recognise that ending homelessness is possible. And it's it's not believe. I deliberately use the word recognise. We recognise that climate change is happening. We don't believe in climate change because the science demonstrates that climate change is happening. The data demonstrates that ending homelessness is possible. This is not a matter of belief. It's a matter of recognition. And we need more voices. We need the innovation community. We need the not-for-profit sector. We need the business community. Get on board with that agenda to help change that and to share those and to share the stories and be part of the local collaborations and what, what we do as the Australian Alliance is to support communities to set up these by name lists. So if you're in a community that doesn't have one, talk to your local community, talk to the NGOs, talk to your local government and say, what are we doing? Why aren't we setting up a zero project? Ask your local members of parliament, how many people are experiencing homelessness in our town, in our suburb? And if they don't know, why not? That's just not acceptable. In 2022, we don't know how many people are experiencing homelessness in whatever community we're in. That's That's not okay. So... My call to action is get out there and, and be an activist on this issue because it's individuals coming together that will make change. That's the only thing that's ever changed things in the world is committed individuals working collaboratively to change things and, and we can do it. Um, it's been demonstrated. Uh, it's just a matter of following and making it happen and that's what we're trying to help make happen. That's brilliant. Um, I know that you uh, recently completed a report on um, the the Alliance to End Homelessness. So um, we'll link, we'll create a link to that in the show notes as well so that um, that will give people some additional information that they can use to to bolster their enthusiasm for coming together and as a community really ending homelessness. Yeah, and that report shows the kind of the needs that individuals have and it analyses all the data that we've got. But if people want to learn more about this advanced to zero approach that we're using in Australia, there's more information on the Australian Alliance website and, you know, we'd love to talk to any organisations and communities that want to do this work. Brilliant. We'll, we'll, um, we'll put a link to that on the show notes as well. So thank you.